think ever since that human beings have ceased to become tribal and advanced towards some sort of civilization, they've always really, uh, managed their relationship with nature in an, a manner where they try to force nature to accommodate their needs. And other than some of the more advanced and wiser tribal societies, they have been doing this. And now the world has gone to such an extent where we're seeing huge lack of potable water and global warming and all the other associated problems with using a sledgehammer to fix all of our infrastructural problems. Um, so what these are examples of are systems using uh, nature as a model, using nature's operating instructions to treat wastewater and other impaired and polluted waters. This example here is South Burlington. This was a, a, a pilot that was done in the mid-90s uh, under, under uh, EPA um, monies and uh, supervision. As you can see, it's not like walking into a conventional sewer plant, so it opens up the possibilities, which are very uh, much a part of the discussion here in Falmouth about not in my backyard. And at this particular plant, people would uh, bring their neighbors over before dinner, and students would go, because it was next to Magic Hat, would go in there and drink beer. And it was a pretty nice place to be. More recently, we just completed, and 2009, uh, the Omega Center for Sustainable Living. It started out as a, uh, I just went there to bid against the local engineering firm and came in about 50 cents on their dollar for a wastewater treatment plant and it evolved into this Center for Sustainable Living. But the waste treatment itself, component itself, not the whole building, did remain in that 50 cents to the dollar. And just this, this was the opening last year. We won't stay on that slide long. Um, uh, but um, since the opening last year, it has been operating successfully and under the supervision of the New York NYDEC, the Department of uh, Conservation. And one of the things that this slide points out from the opening is wastewater treatment can sort of be stacked use. At least that's what we tell people when we're trying to get the Olympic Village in Munich. Um, but it's not just a wastewater treatment plant, but it is also, same problem as Bill, um, but it is also, uh, it's, it's public space, it's a nursery, and it's an opportunity for education of children through to graduate students. And we have much to learn. Uh, from what's happening within these systems, but all of the treatment happens in the zone of where the roots and the water interface and the bacteria that do that, much like Bill's systems with the fish. Um, just two weeks ago, we found this project was LEED certified, and then two days ago when I was in Bogota, we found out that it was the first building in the world to get the living building certification. So that was kind of exciting, but it's also kind of irrelevant. Um, <laughs> this is a system in Honduras at a resort, and um, again, you know, I think the Omega system is very exciting because 15,000 people a year walk through there and see the opportunity of nature, of working with nature's operating instructions and shifting the paradigm from the sledgehammer to the Aikido. But here you'll see one that's sort of built in to enhance the landscape. And one of our short-term goals for that last one you saw was just to produce enough energy via high sugar plants and high oil plants to run a couple of golf carts, not to offset the energy. But our long-term goal is with this is to not have wastewater treatment be uh, energy importers, but to have wastewater treatment be energy exporters, and to do them on a neighborhood level, not in a huge centralized system, and this is a little controversial for Falmouth too, but to, to take responsibility for our waste within our watersheds and our neighborhoods, and also recognize, and I had to take these slides out, I think, for um, the purposes of brevity, but to recognize that within our wastewater, 
are a lot of resources. And one, some of these resources are finite, such as phosphorus. And right now, we run it through the food site. The f wastewater is the apex of the carbon footprint of the food cycle. And we run our phosphorus through it. Either it goes off of the fields and into our waterways and creates huge dead zones in the Gulf of Mexico, or it goes through our bodies and into our Title V systems if we're not on sewer and into our Werner pools in our backyard. And I'm no exception. Uh, by any means, I keep saying next summer I'll build a wetland. Um, but this is the city of Fuzhou, China. Uh, in Fuzhou, the city was built quickly without a lot of thought for infrastructure, and so you'll see that the wastewater, if you flush the toilet in the penthouse, ended up in the street. And that made for pretty unpleasant streets. And so we used a variation of our technology that floats on the surface of the water and extends the root zones down and also uh, includes non-woven geotextile fabrics for surface area, much like the, those bamboo stakes in the fish systems um, for the bacteria that break down the waste to have an attached surface to work with. And so this was the final result of that particular system. And this was by no means as seamless as the photographs might, <laughs> might, 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 might make, make it seem. And there was a long time uh, to get it to comply with the UN open water discharge standards. But in the end, it finally did. And again, you see that instead of having this huge liability, which is crap in a canal, you have now have something, <laughs> something of a resource and a place where people want to go. And as cliche as this might sound, but old people did tell our people that they were seeing birds and butterflies that they hadn't seen since they were children. This is a system for Tyson chicken. It took 1.2 million gallons a day of pretty high strength slaughterhouse waste and got it into compliance for Maryland EPA open water discharge. Tyson had been out of compliance on and off for five years. They had been fined millions of dollars. Uh, the year that we operated this system, um, and it was unfortunately for only one year, long story, but Tyson pulled out of Maryland. But um, during that year, we reduced their electrical footprint by 74%, and that was the equivalent of $150,000. We remained in compliance, uh, aver actually averaging instead of ammonia's up over 11, at, with ammonia's of down close to two milligrams per liter and often less than one. Uh, we planted it all with native Maryland, uh, wetland plants and the sludge which was being uh, trucked out at a rate of about once a week was not pumped. The sludge blank was actually reduced during the year of operations that we had access to the data. Here's a system and this is just sort of uh, an example but this is the Four Seasons in Kona, Hawaii. And the conventional engineering solution was to use 100 horsepower, most of it to extract water out, and then discharge it down into the deep water aquifers. Um, we ended up using two and a half horsepower to use airlifts to recirculate the system through these attached growth uh, from on the bottom to the roots extending down from those floating islands that you see. Uh, we had a great client, David Chai, and what he did is he said, well, I might as well try growing some fish, and so he cranked up the salinity, and the plants all were unhappy, and then they got used to it or died, and then he started growing fin fish, oyster, and Pacific uh, white shrimp, and they were actually serving them at the Four Seasons restaurant. <laughs> but the, so we got an EPA award for it, but the part that to me is most exciting is uh, it says if we set up another area as a fish pond without this system, it would cost close to $10,000 a month in power. This one runs about 400. That's too much for Haiti, but that's pretty good for Kona. Okay, this is just back to that rhetoric about we're, we're, we're mining and we're bringing in phosphorus and we're putting it trains and we're dispersing it over our fields, over the country, and basically, you know, 
in a melodramatic fashion, it all ends up here and creates a dead zone in the Gulf of Mississippi or in our salt ponds or in our rivers. And whether it's phosphorus or nitrogen, these managed properly can be assets and managed improperly will further impair our environment or the Gulf of Mexico's uh, wetlands and shorelines ability to absorb hurricanes like Katrina. Um, one of the tools that we happen to be lucky enough to split that greenhouse with, the, they were working on the technology with Bill Mebbin. And we were working on whether we could use eco-machines combined with mycelia and bacteria that was developed by Steve Boyd. We were working with Reese back there and Matt Beam um, uh, in that greenhouse to do this. And so we took, this is the Fisherville Canal up in Grafton, and it had a huge fire in the 90s, and all of the bunker sea oil, or number six oil, dumped into this canal. And we were able to use these integrated systems to, you can see the oil just on the surface there and on the ice, where Olin Christie uh, collected it. But we were able to, once we had the mycelial community established, we got algal community established, and then we got snails. But anyway, long story short is we got the, uh, the total petroleum hydrocarbons from nine milligrams to, per liter to non-detect. Now here's Paul Stamets who's done a lot of the research and has one of the most famous TED Talks out there, most hit. But anyway, we went to visit him just after that and here he's using just contact in these bunker bags with oyster mushrooms and turkey tails and knocking down fecal coliform counts in watersheds that are polluting the sound where they're growing oysters. And so there's just so much potential of the mycelial community in conjunction with other ecological tools to break down some pretty complex compounds and pollutants. The other thing is even in advanced waste treatment, you still have enough remnant uh, nutrients to get an algae bloom, and this algae can be converted into compost, fodder, or energy. And finally, uh, and I'll try and wrap this up quickly, I have a little bit of time, but um, in nature, there's very little waste. I won't speak in any absolute. So what we did is an experiment, and this experiment, for once, was very carefully documented. And what we took was the Magic Hat solid waste, and we mixed it with one of my father's students was also a chicken farmer, and he raised free-range chickens for sale. And we mixed that with the spent straw that he'd use. We mixed the straw and the brewery waste and um, inoculated it with oyster mushroom spawn and 16 days later these were worth $9.99 a pound at City Market in Burlington. <laughs> so instead of dumping that out you can do something with it and create a secondary economic opportunity and what I think if we'd most like to impart uh, with that is that many of the things that we're looking at as waste now are really just one ecological or biological step away from becoming an asset, and we have to rethink of what we're looking at as waste. Um, so after this, after about two fruitings, these bags would get sent to the worms, and the worms were working in conjunction with uh, the liquid waste, which was being treated in our usual uh, tank fashion, and we were trying to grow yellow perch and tilapia. Um, that part wasn't as successful, but. Um, anyway, so these mycelia mixed with brewery grain and uh, chicken straw was given to the earthworms. The earthworms were given to the fish, but the cat worm castings that were uh, the byproduct of this process, uh oh, it's probably going to go three ahead now. Um, were so powerful and such a good growth medium that we were able to get in an unheated, unlit greenhouse, which was the now defunct South Burlington uh, wastewater treatment plant, um, seven croppings between November and March. And that equaled $25 a square foot, which was by green, northern greenhouse economics really good, especially without heat and without uh, supplemental light. And there's a tiny little fish that 
Bill's laughing at inside. <laughs> um, so here is last month uh, Green Source Magazine, which is the USGBC, and this is how we got, uh, this is that we made lead platinum or whatever for the Omega building. And again, how that started out was, well, how, could we be cost effective um, against a conventional system? And the answer was, if we extract the cost of the eco-machine, yes, very much so. And if you compare this, it's sort of analogous to the old silver one, but this one cost a whole lot less. And it has a whole lot more potential uses. And this is a really good client because they're leaving it open to us to experiment with introducing mycelia to break down endocrine disruptors, to measure the breaking down of endocrine disruptors because we have good evidence but no data that old colonies of bacteria break down endocrine disruptors more successfully than new colonies. And natural systems provide a refugia for the older and oldest colonies of bacteria and even evolving colonies of bacteria. So that was successful in terms of we kept it economic, except the building. Um, and we are meeting the standards uh, that we were challenged, had to meet by the terms of the permit with the NYDEC. And so this is the Omega Institute and it's a feather in our cap right now, but again, we've got some good projects. I just got back from Bogota. And that was an interesting opportunity because we weren't doing um, nice, green, sustainable homes for rich people, but this was, uh, they have, it's called Col Subsidio, and it's basically every time you get paid, they take a little bit out, just like they do with us, but it goes towards a housing fund and education funds, and it's a bureaucracy, but they're building houses for low-income people with it. So. We'll be applying this technology to this low-income housing, and that is why being cost-effective is so important to us. And the people who used to stand in our way, this is the Eugene uh, Water and Electric um, Association and their new campus are now utilizing our services. And I don't, well, they did want to be green and one of their goals was to be sustainable, but also this was cheaper than connecting to their own sewer. And uh, so this was the result. Um, and we just started this and it'll be taking live sewage next week. Um, anyway, the end result is in, after the earthquake in March, I was in Haiti and I had the opportunity to bend a few pipes around through a natural wetland and at the end of which people were washing their clothes and their children and by doing that I improved the smell um, and the water seemed to be a little bit better. And what I'd like to do is to take what we've learned here, keep applying it, but mostly, we need to get to Haiti. We need to do affordable housing here in Colombia, and we need to bring this technology to countries where it's not being afforded because we've continued to marginalize with the collapse of our own engineering infrastructure. We've continued to exploit and marginalize the developing world. Thank you.